Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the, the final keynote uh, lecture of this year's series, Constructs Digital Innovation in the Built Environment. Um, we are very pleased to have uh, Dr. Helen Campbell today. Um, I will give you some information about her and some housekeeping information shortly. For those who don't know me, my name is Eleni Papadonikolaki. I am a lecturer in Building Information Modeling and Management at the Bartlett School of Construction and Project Management. Um, so uh, Helen Campbell will be speaking today about um, from nice to have to must have. And she has she brings a, a long uh, industry career and in, uh, in software engineering. She is currently director of the technical software group at Arab. She is responsible for OASIS, which is a group that develops and takes to market complex technical software. Helen has a background in software engineering. She just mentioned before that she did her PhD at the City University London, just across the street. And she spent her career managing technical teams, developing digital strategies, and finding innovative solutions to complex business problems. She has worked at major companies such as Amazon, Google, Nokia, and recently managing digital services at Ankins. Just before we get started, uh, I have some housekeeping information I've mentioned. So toilets are back at the end of this corridor on your left. Uh, drinks reception will follow this uh, presentation. So we will spend uh, around one hour with presentation from Helen and then a Q&A. And after that, next room we have a drinks reception that you are all um, invited to join as well. We're not expecting a fire alarm to go off tonight, so if this does happen, just uh, please exit the building via the nearest um, fire exit, which happens to be in this room, and then follow members of UCL staff to the assembly point. And finally, please do tweet about uh, this keynote lecture and share your thoughts using the hashtag uh, digital construction. Thank you all very much for coming and enjoy the session. Helen, the floor is yours.
get the mic to work. Yep. So, as Eleni mentioned, my name's Helen Campbell. I work for Arup, and I look after digital development within the Digital Technology Group. Software development goes on all over Arup, but my team, as Eleni mentioned, is responsible in particular for the Oasis products, for various applications that are used internally for Arup, and for some of our automation initiatives. People sometimes ask me how I got involved in software development. Um, my original training and background was an information scientist looking after the management of data and of uh, documents. And what set me off, and I, I worked for a while at the University of London, and what we were doing was we were in the very early days of trying to promote online searching. This is pre-internet, pre-Google, back in the Stone Age. And the databases and data banks we were searching all lived in California in one of two companies, one of which was Lockheed Martin, who were the only people at the time rich enough, wealthy enough to afford the big computers that we actually had to run, that, that could run the searching. In order to connect into the big computers, and remember this was pre-internet, there was in fact a time before the internet was invented, um, we actually had to phone the computer. So you had to do a long distance phone call to California, and it was incredibly expensive. The cost of doing the searching and the cost of the phone call were very, very expensive. We were tasked with trying to get, to open this up to all researchers at the University of London and help people search for themselves. But we had to do this without running up an astronomical bill because it was just so expensive. So we were looking at ways to train people. And I was walking with my boss at the time down Tottenham Court Road one evening, and there were a bunch of electronic shops just before you get to the Tottenham Court Road tube station. And we looked in the window, and there was the first personal computer to hit the UK shores. It was a Commodore PET. It came with a magnificent 16K of memory. Um, you stored the data on a cassette tape, which you had to make sure that you always replayed it back on the same cassette. And you didn't try and save and restore too many times because the tape stretched. Um, and it, we had a copy of Visual Basic, which in retrospect I think was probably bootlegged and a photocopy of the manual for Visual Basic, and that was it. And we thought, yes, we can actually write some training aids with this, which we did. And then when the latest version came out of the Commodore PET that actually had 32K of memory, we wrote a small accounting package to actually manage our team and so on. And from then on, I was totally hooked. It is, if you coded, you know that it can be completely addictive. It's both the challenge of problem solving, but the creative side of coming up with a solution that both works and is elegant. How many people in this room actually code themselves? Do we have? Yay. Okay. Right. Good. Uh, but I've tried to be very good and not use too many three-letter acronyms or um, obscure terminology, so hopefully this works. So tonight, I'm going to be sharing some thoughts on software development in the AEC sector, and in particular looking at why I think software engineering should be recognized as a discipline within the sector. The different types of software development that appear to be going on in AEC companies, how to fail at software development, but also how to succeed and why you need multidisciplinary development teams. Any time anyone mentions AEC and software in the same breath, they always refer to the McKinsey Global Institute's Index of Digitalization, in which AEC languishes at the bottom of the table along with hunting and farming. But I would argue that this only reflects one side of the story. Computing and engineering, in fact, go back a long way. 
I was reminded of this the other day as we were finalizing the alpha release of the cloud version of the Oasis structural analytics software this week. This is the latest incarnation in Arup of the partnership between software and structural analytics that stretches back to the use of computers in the structural analytic analysis of the Sydney Opera House roofs in the 1960s. And yes, that picture up in the upper right hand corner is a computer. I am pretty sure this is just a marketing picture because anything with that number of cabinets would have made a huge row and probably have to have a special chilled room and be tended upon by high priests in white coats. So definitely a marketing blurb. But it was used by Arup at the time to do the structural and analyses that were required to make sure that the roofs of the Opera House actually stayed up. And because the concept design changed frequently, those recalculations had to be done frequently. And if there hadn't been a computer involved, the burden of doing hand calcs for something like this would have just made it impossible. It would have just been too burdensome. Today, our offices bristle with computer screens. If you walk past Arab's offices, just you know, going along the street, you can see inside there's nothing but computer screens. We don't have drawing boards, slide rules, and books of log tables. But while everyone uses software engineering for engineering and design, the development of software itself has not been seen as a core discipline within the sector. Mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, wind engineers, acoustic engineers, geotechnical engineers, the list goes on, but not software engineers. And yet, our engineering work is now completely dependent on software engineering, whether it's to enable us to produce concept designs, analyze structure, ensure tunnels don't collapse, understand the impact of a design on pedestrian movement, detect defects in built assets, work out where to put a new road, or provide our clients with better insights into their project. Software is at the heart. Um, these are a few, just a few of the digital services that Arup now provides, and we are no different from other AEC companies in the sector. Everybody's doing the same, you know, similar sorts of things. They're all software dependent, and frequently involve complex workflows, multiple applications, data management, and sometimes the development of completely new solutions. If we look at the sorts of software development that are going on in AEC companies, it becomes apparent that it's going at a, occurring at a range of different levels of complexity. Many of the third-party products we use have a mechanisms which allow us to develop plugins or add-ins. Um, Revit, for example, that many of you may be familiar with, has a, an option you can build your own little applications and, and plug them in. But to develop more complex applications requires an investment of time and resources that makes one-off use, single-use uneconomic, and besides which, if an application is at all useful, wouldn't you want to use it to do on multiple projects to do multiple things? And so what we're seeing is dedicated developers being hired to build larger, feature-rich applications for use on multiple projects. And sometimes they're sold commercially, but in many cases just used internally, but um, either within a region or globally. Uh, to actually improve the work that engineers do. Experienced software engineers can make a difference to the development of applications, not just because they are more familiar with the tools that are used to do development, but because over a period of time, they learn about patterns, patterns which can be redeployed and reused. This is no different from conventional engineering and construction projects where the more, the closer a new project is to what the team has done before, the more likely you are to be successful. This is another way to look at digital scaling. You can think about it in three bands. We have creative, which is where individual digital designers, who are often self-taught coders, engineers who've taught themselves how to code, 
are building tools that can be used on a particular project. Python and Excel um, are often the tools of choice here. And then you have, if you like, a more formal layer where maybe one experienced software developer works with a, an engineering team to build something that's a bit larger scale, a bit more structured, that can be distributed. And then what I would think of as industrial scale, where you need a more formal, persistent software development team who builds something on a larger scale that can be distributed more widely and used by many more people. The development tools used at each stage differ, and the degree of expertise and experience needed to use them rises as you go through those stages. It is not that engineers cannot become good software developers, but that software engineering is now a discipline in its own right, with its own best practices and its ways of working honed by many years of figuring out what does and doesn't work. And it's simply quite difficult to pick these up by yourself. You end up just repeating the mistakes that everybody else has made over the last 30 years and then figuring out why people do what they do in software engineering. It's to prevent you making the mistakes that you've just made. The foundation of what you learn on a computer science degree is what you learn on a computer science degree, but best practice and structured ways of working are developed by working on a range of projects in a team with other more experienced developers. But even hiring experienced software engineers doesn't automatically guarantee development success. So what could possibly go wrong? Um, as I was putting this talk together, I was reading a book called how not to write a novel, with many helpful hints on how to avoid getting your book published. And so I thought I'd channel that with you and share some ways to ensure a software development project fails miserably. So first strategy, only hire one developer. After all, they are never going to leave. They are never going to go on vacation. And because they are never going to leave, it doesn't really matter that they never documented their code because they actually understand how it works. Don't have any documented requirements. They're in your head and you'll explain it as you go along. Decide to manage the development yourself even though you don't have any software engineering background. For those of you who watch Grand Designs, this is the equivalent of the homeowners deciding they're going to project manage the construction themselves, even though they don't have any construction management experience. Um, and Kevin will roll his eyes. And you know from therein, for the remaining 30 minutes of the program, the project is doomed. There will be overruns. There will be sad events. There will be an enormous budget overrun. Start coding before architecting. This is the equivalent of thinking you can buy a house by going down to home base, buying a pile of bricks, sitting them out in a field, and starting to, to mortar them and cement them together. It doesn't work any more than it would work with a pile of bricks. This is choose the development stack based on what you know. This tends to be a cardinal sin of developers. Once you've invested in learning a development tool, it's the fallback position. If you're asked to build something new, you think, well, what do I know? Oh, I know X. I've always used X. I'm quick at using X. And I really don't want to spend four months learning some new software. But it may not be the best tool for the job. Technology is evolving at such a rapid rate that new tools, new ways of doing things are coming out all the time. You need to always stop and think, is this the right thing to do before going ahead? To absolutely ensure you have a budget and schedule overrun, don't develop testing plans and leave testing till the very last minute. This will ensure, and I absolutely guarantee it, that once you get it and you start testing it, you run into all sorts of problems that will take months to figure out 
you will eventually release it, praying that the users don't spot the same problems and destroy all confidence in the software that you've just built. Keep the developers and the end users strictly apart. The less the developers know about how end users might be using this software, the better. And that means that they will never really understand the problem they're trying to solve. This is a particular guaranteed way to success, to failure, I should say, in the AEC space, where what we want to build is often quite complex, and our end users have quite complex needs. Don't budget for the operational costs. When the developers finish developing, it's done. There will be no additional costs. And of course, the cloud is free, isn't it? And forget about maintenance. Um, it's never going to need updating ever. Which last point allows me to segue into why you might need to do maintenance, why there are always maintenance tasks. All the applications we build sit on top of other software. And those software don't stay still at all. They keep evolving and changing. We all know that built assets require regular maintenance because parts wear out, roads need resurfacing, buildings, surfaces crack or whatever. Software is the same thing. Those of you who've got mobile phones, which I assume is everybody, know how often you get one of those messages saying, iOS needs to update to version, whatever it is, 10.5, or if you've got an Android, to whatever charmingly candy-named operating system that Google's just come out with. The same is true for anything on the application stack there. And while web browsers seem to have somewhat stabilized over the last couple of years, some of this also changes quite frequently. So even if you do not add one single feature to your wonderful application, all of this stack could change, and just one piece will break what you have so painstakingly built. Those of you who might remember the challenges of moving from Windows 7 to Windows 10, because older applications were simply not Windows 10 compatible, and some software companies took a while to update their products. And if you don't maintain an application, the simple consequence is that it will eventually not run on the latest laptops, tablets, or phones. So you can neglect it, but really not a good idea. And the longer you neglect doing the maintenance, the more expensive it will be when you finally come to do it. No different from maintaining built assets. Same problem. Segway over. So why does software development sit somewhat uneasily in the AEC space? I believe that some of this can be put down to differences in ways of working. Let me explain what I mean by a couple of examples. Most modern software is developed using one flavor or another of a technique, a methodology known as Agile. And its popularity over the last decade is due to the fact that it actually does deliver applications that people can use in a reasonable amount of time, whereas the previous way of developing software, known as Waterfall, often didn't. In a Waterfall project, you spend time up front doing detailed requirements gathering, producing detailed specifications, um, doing detailed design, all before you ever start developing. Then you develop, then you put it through testing before it's actually released. In many cases, this would take a year, two years, and by the time you produced what it was that you intended to produce, and you did the grand reveal, you'd find that the people who asked for it in the first place, the end user community, no longer wanted it, or what they wanted was something completely different. Um, some of this never got built. I remember walking into the office of one software company, and they used to build software for publishing. And 
they wanted to bring out a new application for the publishing industry. They had a work breakdown structure that stretched over two walls like that, and then underneath was a bookcase that must have had 20 to 30 ring binders that they said was the requirements specification. Sort of a, not too dissimilar for you know, how I think of specifying, for example, a new ocean liner, you know, that scale. The problem with that is it becomes a very hard problem that's difficult to solve, that takes a lot of time and is very uncertain. And the fact that people are absolutely rubbish at telling you what they want. Um, Steve Jobs famously said he never asked users what they wanted, he just provided it. But unless you're an absolute marketing genius like Steve Jobs, you do actually have to do some asking about people what they would like. Um, a bit difficult to second guess everybody. Agile has become very popular because what it does is it breaks down the problem and is a more evolutionary form of development. It allows you to start off in one direction, but by breaking things down into small chunks, where at the end of each chunk, known as a sprint, you get something that's usable, you can get early stage feedback from users, and if they look at it and say, well, that's not really what we wanted, you've not gone so far down that you can't reverse back and try a different thing or modify it or change it. It's very much more flexible and as a consequence, much more successful. It also time boxes things. The curse of the waterfall method is because it was so difficult to get people to tell you what they really wanted. And because when you finally showed them, it wasn't what they wanted. And because you did all the building before you actually did the testing, the project schedule would slide and slide and slide. And people used to say, oh, it's scope creep. But it was just inevitable because it was really hard to understand what people wanted in the first place. What Agile does is it time boxes things and it makes you more certain of actually delivering something at a particular period of time. However, while this method is brilliant for software development, it is not what AEC projects typically do. AEC projects typically tend to have a more waterfall approach. They start off with design concepts and specifications for fairly obvious reasons. You do not want to get halfway through construction of a 40-story building for somebody to say, you know what, I think I'd rather have 60 stories. Or could we just you know, change all the plant from this side to the other side because I think it's sort of getting in the way. Um, it just doesn't work like that. And so when you put people steeped in these two different approaches together on the same project, there are inevitably misunderstandings and tensions. The engineers are concerned that the software developers aren't working from a detailed specification and, shock, gasp, horror, want to demo applications to users with half the features still not built. This is not complete. Go away. Um, the software developers, on the other hand, don't understand why their business colleagues don't want to be involved in sprint activities like planning and stand-ups and are adopting a call us when it's done attitude. Another tension point arises from the fundamental difference between projects and products. A project tends to be a one-time initiative with very defined start and end points. Mostly we still sell it on a time and materials basis and at the end of the project, the team generally gets redeployed. Typically doesn't continue into maintenance and ongoing support isn't required. Contrast that with products. Products tend to involve iterative development. You build something, you find some bugs, people ask for new features, you build it into version two, people want more features, becomes version three, becomes version four. It also doesn't have a defined end point. It continues into use until, as long as there is a demand for it. One of the most difficult things in software development is actually to decommission something. Microsoft have tried it for years on access. Uh, I remember sort of year after year, you'd see a notice saying, we're stopping support on this. We're, we're ending Microsoft access. And they 
are still unable to do it because people loved it and refused to just give it up. Because you have to keep on developing in this iterative way, you need a persistent development team. I don't mean you actually physically have to have the same people, although a certain amount of continuity helps, but they have to exist and keep on developing it. Um, and then it, as we've spoken about, requires ongoing maintenance and it often requires customer support. If it doesn't work, if your laptop blue screens, if your mobile phone doesn't like it anymore, you need somebody to call and you need somebody at the other end who's going to help you with it. Another tension point, another difference, is a fundamental difference in the commercial models behind services and products. And I'm using products here loosely to mean not just things that you might, applications you might develop to sell, but applications, larger applications that you're using internally as well. So if we look at professional service engagements, the costs and the revenue are generally sort of in step. You do some work, you get paid. You do some work, you get paid. You do some work, you get paid. The risks are well understood, largely because firms in this space have been doing this for a long time. They understand the risks. They put processes in place to mitigate for, for it. The returns are reasonably assured. Very few companies start off on a project that they know is going to be a loss maker right at the beginning. So they've sort of usually got this squared away. There is a confidence in the market needs, and there's a known process for winning work that often involves a long-time relationship with a small set of clients. Product development, whether you're selling it commercially or using it internally, has a completely different business model. You have to invest a lot of money up front in the beginning with no returns whatsoever and at a particular high risk. You build something and you hope that it's going to be adopted, but you don't know. And it can take months, sometimes years, to get the return on that in initial investment. And professional services companies, not just AC companies, but the Accentures, you know, the Deloitte's, whatever, are simply not set up with that business model. It's a completely alien business model. So how do you attract those talented developers that you actually need to create the applications you want to build? How do we in the AEC sector compete for talent against the Googles and the Microsoft? We're sitting here tonight and up the road is uh, Google's big office in, uh, behind King's Cross. Facebook are building another equivalent office. Microsoft is there down the road. You know, all the big names are here. How do we get the talent? And then to the east, we have Shoreditch and the Wellcool companies where you can bring your pet along to work and they generally provide really good coffee. I would argue that although on the surface it looks like we're at a disadvantage, we do have some advantages over those big names and over the cool startups because we can provide opportunities to work with really smart people on really hard, real-world problems and make a difference. The Oasis developers, for instance, get out, kick out of visiting King's Cross Western Concourse and seeing the branching tree structure that their software was used to structurally analyze. Um, we also you know, go through Toronto Union Station and we see a pedestrian concourse that we've helped to avoid congestion. Our software has, we hope, played some small part in shaping a better world. And people underestimate how motivating this is to many developers. It is so much more interesting to be working with a group of smart engineers on an interesting project than, for example, just being one of a team of 100 people producing the next version of whatever it is that you're working on. Um, once hired, we need to retain that developer talent 
And part of the trick to that is to develop meaningful roles and career paths that include leadership roles. We also need to ensure that our developers keep up to date with the latest technologies. There is nothing sadder than reading a CV where somebody says that the latest version of Microsoft SQL Server they worked on was 2008, or you realize that they've got no cloud experience or no modern JavaScript experience whatsoever. We owe it to our developer community to help them to keep up to date. Recognizing the contribution of developers is also really critical. If in your company, the only people who get a shout out, who get praise, are engineers in other disciplines, you send out a clear message that software engineers are not valued in the same way. And people will leave. And to create a high performing developer community that others will want to join, you also need to build up a critical mass. Uh, of developer expertise. You don't need thousands, but you ha need to have enough people so that people can share ideas, people can support each other. There's always that moment in software development where you get totally stuck on something um, and you can spend all day looking at it and you can't make it work. And then a colleague comes over and looks at it and goes, oh, you've left out a comma here or you should have done it this way. And you think, fabulous, why didn't I ask before? But it's so important to have that community around it. And I would strongly recommend that once you've got that, you start a graduate program to bring in fresh ideas and new expertise. But it's difficult on any software development to always match the demand against the supply. Even if you've built up a great team of developers, you may suddenly want to develop something that requires a skill set that your developers don't happen to have. They, you may, for example, suddenly need to have an Android mobile phone developer on your team, or you may have a great SQL developer, but now you need Hadoop. What do you do? Of course, you can actually hire or train, but all of this takes time. So one option, this is where trusted development partners can come in. Development partners can help build bridge skills gaps while you hire and train. They may have staff with scarce skills that you may find difficult to hire, or maybe you only need for a short period of time. And by having more in-depth experience with a particular technology, they can help accelerate your development project. Over the years, different collaborative models have grown up. Outsourcing is where the entire development process is handed off to a third party, just thrown over the wall. Uh, an extended team concept is where the third party doesn't sit somewhere else, but they're regarded as part of one unified team. But my preferred approach is co-located team working, where you actually bring them in they sit with you, they work together as one team, and you can share knowledge, and you become upskilled from their experience and knowledge. As with any partnership or relationship, it is important to both understand the expertise fit, but also the cultural fit and agreed ways of working. Failed relationships occur in all walks of life, and development is no exception. So if you want to ensure that developing with a development partner is going to be a failure, here's what you can do. First of all, don't explain what you want to build. Assume that it's absolutely obvious. Don't check that they've really understood what they're being asked to build. So there you are, you are competent aeronautics engineers, and you've just hired in a bunch of people whose only experience is doing consumer apps on the mobile phone. And you are not really going to check that when you mentioned all those three-letter acronyms and showed them long mathematical uh, algorithms that they actually understood what on earth you were talking about. Have them working in a very different time zone. That will ensure that 
your team and their team never really collaborate because nobody wants to stay up so late or get up so early in the morning. And if they do, they're tired and a bit grumpy and haven't had enough coffee anyway. Don't build a relationship with them because you're only ever going to do this one project and then you're never going to work with them again and it'll all be done and they'll hand over the code and there will never any need to speak to them or deal with them ever again. And again, do not let them come into contact with end users. You're going to take care of this because you understand what end users really need. They just need to be told. Don't have any clearly, accept, uh, clearly defined acceptance criteria or anyone to check that they're being met. So they're just going to build something. And when they say they're done, they're just going to give you something. And you can then see if it works or not. Never turn up to stand-ups, planning sessions, or retrospectives. Just tell them to get on with it. Hurry up, please. You know, we're a bit late already. And wait till they deliver the application before reviewing it. Because, of course, it'll be exactly what you wanted. So having spoken about all the ways in which you can totally screw things up, here's some ways in which you can be successful. If you're developing with the business, with your colleagues who are engineers, first of all, you really do have to partner with them. You have to bring them into the process. You need to, and this sounds really obvious, but you actually have to address real unmet needs. One of the challenges of being a technologist is you fall in love with the technology and you forget that it really, to be successful, has to solve a real problem. So I went through a period in which, which I spent ages trying to figure out a way in which I could use Alexa's voice technology um, on some of the applications we were building. Because I thought it would be really cool to be able to say, Alexa, structurally analyze this particular thing, and though it would go and do it, and just say, and the answer is 42. Um, <laughs> brilliant. However, most of us work in, even if it was possible to do technically, one, it's not actually solving any unmet need, and two, most of us work in open plan offices. So if you scale this up and everybody was talking, you'd have complete acoustic chaos. So, okay, bad idea. Back to the drawing board there. And you do need to, and this is another obvious point, you need to be able to quantify the value that's being delivered. I mean... You're asking the company to invest money in you and your team to build something. You ought to be able to at least explain what problem it's going to solve and why the company should be, able to do, should be doing it. You need to understand the life cycle costs and budget accordingly. The fatal temptation here is to just look at how much it costs to get the first version out. But as we've discussed, that is never job done for a product or a software application. It's an iterative process. It will have a life after that. There will need to be maintenance. There will need to be bug fixes. There will need to be features added. And if you're doing what you should be doing these days and building for the cloud, there are cloud costs. Sadly, Amazon has not donated AWS free to the world. Sadly. Maybe Mr. Bezos will eventually have so much money that he can afford to do it, but we're not there yet. You need to stand up a multidisciplinary team. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the next slides. Um, but don't be afraid to ask in outside help. It's hard to have a complete skills profile these days. And sometimes just bringing in somebody who's got experience in a particular technology can really accelerate what you're doing. Use agile techniques and development best practices. Things like architecture reviews, code reviews, and coding standards, coding, code naming standards. Names are, curiously enough, one of the biggest areas where people fight in software development teams because everybody has their approach to the naming of things. And there's a kind of, I don't know, weird thing about names, which is if you name something incorrectly and you don't choose a name that really describes what it does, it will never actually end up doing what you thought it was going to be doing. It sort of morphs to whatever it is you called it. 
address the whole user experience from start to finish. User interface design is not icing on the cake that you just, you know, decorate on once you've done all the really hard work. You actually have to think about how users are going to use this application and think about it right from the beginning. The user interface design will fall out of that user experience, but it's not just something you can think about at the end. Sadly, most people from an engineering background and this includes software engineers, are rubbish at doing the user interface and, and the user experience. This is why computers still have all the actual super buttons on the back. Um, the same problem that we used to have with video recorders. You know, get down on the back, pull the thing out, try and rewire it. Same thing on my router. So, Automate testing and deployments. I think this is, again, something you want to think in right from the beginning, because the more automated the testing you do, the more secure you can feel when you actually make changes, because you can run the regression testing easily. And with all the different DevOps software now available for the cloud, automating the deployments is also uh, a real essential. And then I would also advise future-proofing as best you can by using the latest technologies in the cloud. It's impossible to do this with any 100% certainty. There will always be maintenance in our lives, but at least you can get yourself off to a head start by using the latest versions of whatever development tools you're using. Yeah. So now let's talk a bit about the concept of multidisciplinary team development. And here is the simple fact that development needs more than coders. This is the number one reason why you end up with a single person working on a development project. It's because somebody somewhere thinks that all you need is somebody to code. And that is not true, particularly when you look at applications of any scale. If I look at the actual development team, you need a whole range of people from UX, UI designers, QA and testing, having a good QA person who really understands automated testing will absolutely save you so much time and pain. Business analysis. Somebody can actually help you understand what the users want to do and craft these into what's called a backlog. A scrum master to actually manage your agile processes. Delivery or release management to help you actually get it from development into production. Data engineers, data scientists, and this new role that's called DevOps that nobody can quite explain, but it does the magic between when you finish and when it gets up in the cloud. And then supporting those, there are colleagues who are going to be responsible for application architecture, service transition managers, cybersecurity, uh, the people who will help you provision the cloud and we'll do the operational management once you've got it up into the cloud. And then supporting that business teams that can help you with things like the help desk, um, with a business owner, with subject matter experts. And not to forget legal and HR. If you're thinking of selling anything commercially, there are those little things called terms and conditions and you know, rights to, to the application to make sure that you're not selling something you didn't actually have the rights to sell, and that if it blows up their mobile phone, it is not your fault. You have no liability in this, in this respect. How does this look if we think about a team? So there are some roles where on a particular project, those roles need to be there all the time. So you have tech lead, you have a number of developers, note the plural. Uh, you may have domain experts. Some of the complicated software we would want to develop in the AEC space requires having subject matter experts, the engineers, the people that have built the algorithms actually working side by side with the software developers. Um, data scientists and data engineers. Some projects may need them if you're doing something to do with big data, other projects maybe not. 
and then supporting then shared services, people and expertise you can bring in when needed would include service transition, business analysis, UX, UI, application architecture, QA, DevOps, product management, all working together as a multidisciplinary software development team. And so finally tonight, thinking about this multidisciplinary approach, I wanted to end up with some thoughts for, from Ove Arup himself. Ove, whose pioneering use of computers in engineering was one of the drivers behind software development in AEC. He believed in a holistic approach to design that he called total architecture, which for him meant joining all the professions right from the start. And if we think about total design in the digital world or software development, surely the sentiments are the same. That total design in the digital world implies that all relevant design decisions have been considered together and have been integrated into a whole by a well-organized team empowered to fix priorities. Thank you. mentioned that um, technology is changing and you explained how you've seen the evolution of doing searching mm -hmm. and queries mm -hmm. back a uh, few years ago, yes. couple of years ago. And you've seen how you've seen the evolution of technology, how all this is changing. So when do you consider that we will see eventually the software engineering becoming a core discipline in the AAC? So what is the outlook of construction in terms of that? I think it's already there, it's just not recognized as such. So my argument is that it should be recognized as such because we are so fundamental now to the way in which AEC projects are carried out and how we think about doing design and construction. Thank you very much. So I completely agree with like 99% of the this area I work in consulting and Projects and I, I completely agree, especially developers not seeing users. I see all the time people not coming to sprint, absolute classic, and then they're like, oh, we don't really know what's going on with the business side of this. The one thing I was really interested in was the architectural side of things. Yes. And, and I was a, I designed cars before I ever designed software, and then you had to lay out at least a fundamental architecture at the beginning to know what space you had to play with yes. to design as you went. With microservices architecture, do you and Aaron start seeing more organic architecture coming rather than a predefined architecture at the beginning, or would you still sit there and lay everything down? Because that means so much investment cost before you ever build anything, which is what I always try to avoid if I make money from week yeah. one, week two, I think it's it started to be a hybrid situation. I would regard microservices and equivalent of Lego building blocks. It means you don't have to go and start from the very grassroots every single time, but you have to start off with at least a vision of what the target architecture is going to be and what microservices you can use. So one of the things we're looking at is how do we curate those microservices so that people in the company know they exist and use them rather than try and build their own every time. Yeah. Um, but I still believe it's fundamental to have at least a plan in your mind, which you may change as things evolve, but at the beginning, a plan. Another question? Yeah. Thank you. Um, that was really interesting. So, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm an architect by trade, so I didn't understand most of that. Um, it's slowly trying to. <laughs> Get um, I'm interested, when you, when you spoke about it being a standalone profession, um, do you see your profession, I guess, influencing the other professions in the next couple of years? And the reason I ask is, as an architect, um, especially in the last 12 to 18 months, the amount of 
structural engineer companies in particular like our the scale of our um, doing computational design is very much looking to challenge our potential practice. Mm -hmm. So I think it comes back to this, you know, Arab, over Arab's vision that actually, even before the advent of software engineering as, as a discipline, that he saw all the different disciplines that were involved in, in a, constructing something in the built environment working together. And I would counter and say where I see software engineering as a discipline is partnering side by side with architects, with structural engineers, around producing something in the built environment, whether it's a building or a road or a metro station or whatever. We need to work together. Um, one of the things I hope to sort of convey in today's talk is that if you put software engineers in a room and you don't let them talk to the people for whom they're trying to design an application, you are doomed to failure from the start. And this is particularly so with a, the AEC space. If you th want to build a, a mobile phone application for the consumer market, your software developers might have some view of how consumers might use it because they'll be consumers themselves. But if you want to build a complex flight scheduling application or you want to do something in the structural engineering space and you keep the the software developers away from the actual engineers, it, it can't succeed. There needs to be that collaboration. Do you think the structural engineers are inclined to go and learn about the software side? So I, I, I started off designing chassis systems, cars and brake systems. And as we move to electric vehicles, I had to go and learn. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a job now. Um, and a lot of my friends who didn't bother to learn and say, let me have hydraulic braking systems, now I can't get work. What, what's it like in Arab and what's it like in the structural engineering? System? Well, it's not just structural engineering. You can see it across all the different di engineering dif disciplines. There is, as we sort of, as the talk noted, almost everything we do now involves software. You, you actually can't do it without software being there. It's just no longer possible. Um, so everybody's got to learn not just how to use the software, but increasingly how to get the best out of it by extending it, because a lot of the big software packages allow you to do those extensions. How to move data from one software package to another software package, because all the workflows are now more complicated. And then how to manage the data. And I can see over the next five years, the whole issue about data is going to be fundamental to how we work. Do, do you find they're willing to learn that? So I've worked with chemical engineers at BP, yeah. um, mechanical engineers, and they are just utterly clueless about what's going on. You can tell them anything <laughs> about how an IT system works. And unless it's a bit of BBA and Excel, they don't care or don't want to know. Excel, I, would, I will say without any hesitation, is undoubtedly the most used software package in the AECC space. If Excel disappeared, I don't know how any projects would actually ever get done. Um, but I think this is changing. You can see this in some of the younger graduates that are, that are coming into the profession that have been trained up at a university to use some of the systems we use. And there are always enthusiasts, uh, you know, even in the uh, above the graduate level, people who are interested, who've learned, who've, who've taught themselves, who want to understand. You know, I think a lot of engineers do have that mentality where they want to understand what's under the hood and figure out how things work. But like any profession, there are always some that, you know, don't. Maybe it's not they don't. Maybe they're too scared to well, take that person. They, they may be too scared and also maybe just not have the time because this does require an investment of time and effort. Um, whenever I'm learning you know, a new software package, I always have two weeks that I've learned to call my kick the cat weeks. <laughs> not that I have a cat or ever harm any animal, but <laughs> there will be two weeks in which I will hate it. It will not work. I will not even be able to do the first simple hello world thing and it will be miserable. 
and you know, after that you get along. But it's being brave enough to do that, having the time to do that, and the confidence to do that. And that's often, you know, people have their heads down trying to do billable work. There's also the curse of billable work, which I think impacts us a lot. No, no, no. I just mentioned that because um, that, that I felt was perhaps a common thing that everybody understood. But software is being used, you know, anywhere you can use software uh, and can use it to change how things work, then it's being used. Chemical engineering, acoustics, wind, you know, facades. I think the challenge comes down to, so I think there's a couple of challenges. One is not all companies want to be software companies, and that's perfectly okay. But the other comes back to this fundamental difference in underlying business models behind the way that professional services work and the way that software development works. Um, if I wanted to go out and build a piece of software, whatever it is, and I wanted to set off on my own, Helen's super fabulous startup, whatever. Um, and I could, you know, the first thing I'd do is try and go and find a venture capital company to invest in me, get a chunk of money, and then start building something. But I wouldn't expect, and the venture capital company wouldn't expect to see a return on that for a long period of time. When you're working in a professional services company, and it, this is not just something in the AEC space, it's in any professional services company, then you need the company to actually invest, make that investment up front. And they're not going to get any return on that for some period of time. And the return is uncertain. You can come up with a fabulous idea internally that you think is going to be a huge productivity improvement, for example, but it's still a bet. And the company has to be prepared to make that bet. Um, I gave a talk on this topic about two years ago in New York. And it was a mixed group of AEC companies from very big to actually some small consulting companies. And in the conversations afterwards, it was clear that the smaller consulting companies felt really disadvantaged now because they simply did not have the resources to invest in that kind of software development, which the bigger companies did. Uh, I mean, <coughs> Margins are so Margins thin. Are, are yeah. Small, so yes. I guess that they, well, it puts off a lot of people from like, uh, innovate, uh, yes. a bit of innovation there, which I guess the software part would be part of that innovation. Yes. Yeah. So, it, one, it puts people off innovation, and two, because you're doing so things at scale, often in the construction side of things, you've got big projects, the software that you tend to use to manage that tends to come in very expensive with zeros at the end of it as well, and requires a lot of investment in learning how to use it. It's a double-edged sword. It's really interesting. The guy who runs Y Combinator says the opposite to what everyone is taught about digital stuff. And for anyone who doesn't know, Y Combinator is one of the biggest mm -hmm. accelerators in the yeah. world. They accelerated Airbnb. Yeah. And they told the Airbnb founders, and this is where I picked this up from, from their stories, yeah. don't worry about scale at the beginning. 
yeah. prove your concept first. So mm -hmm. the best example I had when I was at BP, they launched a service called Karama, and it's how to go and repair your car. And mm -hmm. they were building this whole platform of all these different garages where you go mm -hmm. in and look to repair your car and everything else. Like, go and find a small village with a car yeah. garage that's a decent garage, it's empty. Yeah. Start a WhatsApp group, yeah. 150 people who live in the village with their car, and see if you can get them to go there. Yeah. That costs nothing. Absolutely, well, not nothing, but a graduate's time walking around an area. Instead, they spent four million pounds building a service that it turned out no one wanted. They got sunk in the hole. Yeah. And exactly as you said, you have this, this discounted cash that yeah. dips at the bottom. Yeah. And I, for me, I think that's absolute suicide for service projects. I don't know how you can do this in construction because I don't know the sector very well. But. The difficulty is, is that balance between can you start off small enough to do something useful and usable at the end of it? And sometimes the scale makes it quite difficult to do that because it's too small and you, you can't even prove the con concept properly. Or you get down to the, I'll just put Bob on it, um, stick Bob in the basement and Bob come back in 12 months when you've actually built something and that doesn't work either. It's yeah, getting okay, the balance right. Like the yeah. Website, right? When you come back yeah. in two weeks and yeah. you go, yeah, I've got 10 yeah. people to go to a garage. Yeah. How many bookings yeah. did they have before that week? No. <laughs> yeah. But then, you know, the company still has to take the risk. And one of the challenges is in construction, particularly where the margins are so thin, where everybody's tried to build in contingency because they don't, you know, there's so much risk in the whole venture anyway. People are very risk averse. It's hard. First of all, thank you very much. Um, I have worked in as an architect for software engineer for 14 years. I've developed everything from the smallest plugin to the most complex geometry that's been built. Um, I found eventually most of my time is actually consulting to the architect to actually um, understand the problem and at the time to rationalise that complex geometry. Is that something that you find at Arab that these software engineers, these guys have got this? hands-on experience with delivering not only geometry but software that goes around architecture that actually the conversation gets rid of the software at some point? I don't know if the conversation gets rid of the software but I do know that adoption is quite difficult because a lot of what we build is complicated, requires a lot of engineering knowledge and willingness to learn a complex piece of software. Um, it's like some of the software's you know, level of complexity I just put on a par with learning to fly a plane. Um, and again, uh, a lot of people don't want to spend the time or, or the investment in, in learning how to really use it, particularly when they think two years down the line is going to be a completely new package and I'm going to have to learn how to do it again. Um, it's tough. And then, you know, do you as a company, and you've just bought the latest super whizzy new thing from Autodesk, for example, and you want to get it out there, you've probably not factored in the cost of actually going around training everybody and getting them up to speed and, and helping them to learn. And that can be as much cost as the cost of the original software itself, more. Um, but it's, yeah, it's not easy. I think there is, I think, but I think it's emerging in different ways. So if you look at what Autodesk have done with Forge, it's partly, I think, a realization in Autodesk that they cannot build everything that everybody wants with all the variations and configurations. It's just not possible for one company to do that. And so what they're trying to do 
whether they've succeeded or not is a, is a different matter, is, is what Salesforce.com have done, which is to provide components and microservices in which you can actually package up to do your own thing. That's the big vision. That's what they'd like to do. Other software companies are trying to build SDKs. You know, we've built one ourselves around our pedestrian simulation system so that you buy the core and then we enable others to build out around it. And that way you get a little bit of the best of both worlds. The core continues to be the core. The external bits continue. Other people can then continue to evolve it. There is something of a move to open standards because people don't want to be locked in um, to a particular ecosystem. What we have seen in the last couple of years is some of the bigger companies going around buying a lot of the smaller applications um, and creating de facto monopolies. And so you don't want to be caught there. And then we never, I think, almost never use just one piece of software in a particular workflow. So whatever ecosystem you start off with to do one thing, inevitably you need to do something in another piece of software that comes out of a different ecosystem and we need to get to a point where the things are interoperable. And I think we're going to see a big push to interoperability um, in the next couple of years. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Wonderful presentation. So thank you all very much for attending this. That concludes our keynote lecture series for this year, the University of next year. Please uh, join us for drinks. Thank you very much.